good evening. I'm very happy that you was able to join me. I'd like to welcome all the friends, and uh, I'm not going to refer to an audience, but friends um, from Anchorage and from Colorado Springs, and also my guest, Jim Clarkson, that I accidentally ran into a few years ago. Welcome to Olympia, and um, thank you for giving us this exclusive uh, interview here. Um, the reason today is somewhat special is because it is December the 21st and it's a winter solstice. And I have a little problem with some of these big words like equinoxes and solstices. And um, what happened today actually was the sun and the moon, I'm sorry, the sun and the earth is aligned in a straight line which creates a an equator in Across the galaxy? No, I, I, I can see it, it's a galactic equator in the Milky Way. Here, here we go. And so that hasn't happened in 6,500 years, so it's a very special day. And it's also snowing like crazy. So did you have a nice trip to come up here? It was a bit of an ordeal, Lillian, but it was more than worth it. And to be honest, Every time I've met you, it's always been an extraordinary experience for me because you've helped open my eyes to a different way of seeing the universe, and that's really important to me because my regular background is a bit more conservative and narrow, and you've helped broaden my perspective. So all you needed was one person of high strangeness, yes? Exactly. Okay. You've been the catalyst <laughs> for a lot of change. Yeah. So what, what I thought I would like to do instead of... Um, eventually interrupt you. I want to chit chat with you a little bit and then when you get ready to share your presentation with us, I'm not going to in interrupt you at all. Um, I'd like to refresh your memory about a spear that I have. Uh, do, you, do you remember that? Oh, I remember it quite vividly. Yeah. Well, what happened, I was up in Anchorage at one time and um, it, on a day much like this, it was snowing, and my friend Monica and I, we would um, just drive around, you know, uh, looking at the city. And we ended up at a beach shop, and as soon as I got into this beach shop, I knew there was something there that I needed, so to speak. Well, we looked at all the beads and all the baskets, and the lady kept saying, well, what is it you need? And I said, lady, I don't know, but whatever it is, it's from... It's from Africa, and she says, oh, I know what that is. And she goes to the back, and um, going back a little bit, I always knew I needed a spear at one time or another, okay? And she said, there is a spear back here on consignment. So, of course, I bought it, and buying it was the easy part. We had to, um, we had to put it on a plane to go to Seattle, you know? So we eventually found somebody to... Um, I wrap it all up, and when I got to Seattle, it, it had worked its way all the way out of the box. And actually, it was a spring a spring solace, remember? That's right. Uh-huh, and I brought it, and I showed it off, and you said, I know what that is. And so if you like to share, and... Well, I, I believe, based upon my knowledge of military weapons and history, that this is a lion hunting spear. Mm-hmm. And the reason that it's significant is that this is one of the bravest ways to hunt a very fearsome and dangerous animal. And you have to have absolutely perfect timing. You have to be in the right place at the right time. And if you make a mistake, it will certainly be your last. <laughs> By that I mean you have to get the lion to spring on you. And the goal of using a double-ended spear to kill the lion is that at the last possible moment, you dig one point into the earth, you hold the other point out, and you pray that you have it pointed at the lion's heart so that it will stop beating before he mauls you to death after he's impaled on the spear. So needless to say, there probably aren't too many amateur lion hunters who use this spear. They would all be experts if they were around to tell about it. Yeah, so that kind of symbolizes my life in the last eight, nine years, being in the right place at the right time and <laughs> make sure you don't stick it in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for sharing that with me. And so I'm going to put that back here before we hurt ourselves. Now, and you live in Aberdeen? Yes, I do. Okay. 
would you like to uh, share how we met, maybe? Um, I think that would be a great story. I, as I recall, the first time that I ever saw you was August 20th of 1996. And I have to back up a little bit or the people listening won't understand how we met. I'm a state section director with the Mutual UFO Network, which is an organization of over 5,000 members in the United States, and the membership is continually growing. All of the people in MUFON, or the Mutual UFO Network, are volunteers. Mm -hmm. And in other words, we all do something else to earn our paychecks, but we have this abiding love at getting to the bottom of the mystery of unidentified flying objects. And in my own case, I'm now 47 years old, and I knew when I was probably 13 or 14 that this was something I had to do. And ever since then, I've been collecting articles, books, anything I could lay my hands on related to UFOs. I've always been more interested in that than anything else. In the meantime, of course, I'm also a law enforcement officer, which may seem a little bit odd, the two of them fitting together, but I hope that by the time we're done with these programs that it will be very obvious as to how one serves the other. In any event, I was sent, as I recall, based upon information that I received from the directors, Larry and Marilyn Childs in Seattle, and also information that I received from Peter Davenport at the National UFO Reporting Center, which is also located in Seattle. In Seattle. Yeah. And I don't remember at this time who called them, but in any event, I was told that I needed to contact this family that lived up the Wainuchi Valley. And it was a very interesting place because they were very interesting people in and of themselves, and I'm not sure that they would necessarily want me to identify them. They seem to be fairly yeah. private people. Yeah, no, we don't, we don't but have to they do that, yeah. have a very unique livelihood. They raised these gorgeous fish called koi, and they have 60 ponds. Mm -hmm where they live, and each pond is probably, oh, 25 by 30 feet and about 10 to 12 feet deep, and there's approximately a dozen to 20 koi in each one of these ponds. And what had occurred that caused them to call the National UFO Reporting Center was that three women were standing out in back of the house, and this house overlooks a large open expanse that leads to the forest. And this was late in the evening, as I recall. About 11 o'clock. About 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And everything became very, very quiet. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about how quiet it had become. And then all at once, a glowing sphere rose up off the back lawn. And it was, my understanding of it was, it was almost like it had the motor running and it was sitting there in the dark with the lights out. Well, I was there. I tell you what it okay, did. Okay, that's was even better. Lights on, lift off, over and out. <laughs> that's what it did, and and it just happened that quick. And I was, as I recall, your one woman was standing there in shock. You yeah. almost fell off the off the porch. I wanted to catch it because I I figured now I can prove it. So I, it was not very uh, smart because I could have fell off the balcony. But here was my chance. I was just going to catch it. Yeah. And the lady of the house. <laughs> ran through the house as fast as she could and went out the front door just in time to see it go streaking off into the distance. And the interesting thing was there were also multiple sightings of fireballs and spheres throughout the Northwest that night. Yeah. In any event, at what point? Well, I, well we called you UFO reporting center and they in turn contacted you to right. uh, to Miss Childs and then uh, of course I had to go back to that location and then here you came. Exactly. And that's how we met. And we went to the pond too. That was a very port important element of this case was that out of these 60 ponds, the pond that was closest to the point where the sphere arose up out of this huge back lawn area, that pond turned a very deep, ugly, rust red brown color, and all of the koi fish died overnight in that pond, and no other pond was affected by whatever this was. I can't say absolutely for sure that the sighting of the sphere was directly connected with the death of the fish, 
but we've come up with no other plausible explanation yeah. since. A lot of coincidences here. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, so so we've kept in touch ever since. We have a lot of mutual friends that we'll talk about later. Exactly. Daryl Sims, for instance. The alien hunter. The alien hunter, yes, and hopefully he's going to do a show when he's in town because we're going to have a lot of local uh, people that is very much involved in things and ever once in a while we will have one not so local person and Daryl of course would be one of those. Yes, I believe he lives in Texas. I, yes, I'm in Texas when he's not traveling. Um, he was just in Eastern Europe for for a little while. And so, well anyway, what is, you brought a lot of goodies here so let's see what you have. Well, yes I did. Yeah. And. I guess where I need to go with this is to sort of tell the very end so that everyone will understand all the steps along the way. Oh, it's like me. I do everything backwards. So I thought about good, that and I decided good. that that was the approach we should take. Yeah. This show is dedicated to a dear friend of mine named June Kaba, who died this year on August 23rd at the age of 73. And she had had a long bout with cancer and when I met her, she was in remission. I originally met her five years ago and I was doing a lecture at Ocean Shores mm -hmm. and she came up to me after my lecture and she started telling me little bits and pieces of her life story. And I was so intrigued that I asked her if I could interview her and go forward and at that time she didn't want to be interviewed and she told me that someday, you know, when mm -hmm. the time was right, she would contact me. And that turned out not to be until the 50th anniversary of the crash at Roswell, mm -hmm. which was in July 4th of 1997, 50 years after the event. And she called me out of the blue. I didn't expect this at all. And she said that she was ready to tell her story because she was so angry at the government mm -hmm. for their third final explanation of what crashed near that small desert town so many years ago. And she said, I remember it quite vividly. She said, what are they going to do? Put me in prison or shoot me? I can do either one. Yeah. And so today, this show is going to be dedicated to her because I have two documents with me which sort of go right to the heart of what it is that I'm trying to present. And I have a document that's a copy of Notification of Personnel Action. And this has a War Department seal on the top. This of course is a photocopy. I have the original papers stored away and this talks about June M. Crane confirmation of war service appointment indefinite dated July 3rd 1942 Wright Field, Ohio. I have numerous other documents that trace her work history that would prove conclusively where she worked. And that sets the backdrop for one of the most extraordinary stories that I've ever heard. So if, if we see you on a milk carton, we know where, what happened to you, right? Right, I'm now missing. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully I won't be. And it turns out, just today, I was contacted by a man named Ryan Wood down in uh, San Francisco Bay Area. He's very interested in getting the June story because it turns out to be the foundation of a still more important revelation. Really? A man named Joe Firmage has put over two million dollars of his own money into trying to bring to light the truth of a large collection of documents. And these documents have been known to the UFO research community for the last two years. Mm. Only a few UFO researchers, the very top people, and approximately a week and a half ago on Art Bell, they made an extraordinary disclosure. And I will state right up front, uh, some people kind of turn their head and look away if you mention Art Bell. And all I will say about him is, I do not believe everybody who is on his show, nor do I believe everything that's presented there. But okay. it's a very important forum for new and radical ideas. And this is how I first heard of these documents. Because I was listening that night, I knew that I needed these documents. I knew immediately how important the June story was. And I knew that all of this would somehow work together. And that became an even more remarkable series of synchronistic 
coincidences that have led us to being here today, yeah. that led me to appear at a MUFON meeting in Seattle when I'd been unable to attend for over two years because of work and children and all those things. I went to that one meeting and I met a man there who in turn emailed Daryl Sims, who has since contacted me because he has more information that may help all of this fit together. And what is the point of all this and why is this so important? And why should it be important to a small town policeman? Well, because this is, I believe, important to everybody. We may be on the verge of proving that we are not alone, that we have not been alone all along. This has just been an illusion that we've lived under. And one of the ways that we're going to prove that is that we're going to use the documents that have been obtained from our own government. And what I have in my hand is a document that's called Extraterrestrial Entities and Technology Recoveries and Disposal Top Secret Magic Eyes Only, the highest level of security classification that there is. This level of security classification is so far above top secret that I would doubt very seriously that even the President of the United States or is currently privy to all of this information. And I know that sounds like an extraordinary claim. A man named Carl Sagan, who was, yeah. was greatly opposed to anything yeah, that you was. and I believe in or are interested in, he said that extraordinary claims demand extraordinary proof. And I guess what I hope to present here to support these documents, to support the June story, is that we have that extraordinary proof. It's all around us all the time. All we have to do is just open our eyes and take a look. Yeah, can we help you with that? Certainly. And I guess by way of uh, a little bit of background, which I alluded to, I should <coughs> just let you know that I've been in the Mutual UFO Network for 10 years. I've been a state section director for most all of that. I'm also a field investigator because there aren't that many MUFON members where I live, so I have mm -hmm. to wear multiple hats. And as I mentioned, I am a law enforcement officer. I'm also a family man. I have 19 years with the police department where I work now in a city in Grays Harbor County. I'm in charge of the fatal accident team. I've been a detective sergeant. I'm currently a patrol sergeant. I'm also a veteran. I've been an, a military policeman with the U.S. Army. I, uh, so, may, in short, it's hard to pull the wool over your eyes. I believe that it would be very hard to do right. in the long run. And the only reason I say that is not to sing my own praises, but to establish my credibility, that I don't say these things lightly. It took me a long time to get to know June, and if you knew June, you would know that this is the kind of woman who everything she told you, she believed with all of her heart, and if you didn't believe it, mm -hmm. That was just tough. I remember I saw you, I believe, in Ocean Shores before I took my trip when I bought my book. And you had just met her, and you, you made mention about this wonderful woman that really didn't care whether anybody believed her or not. And then um, I think when you finally did meet her, I was at the Hopi Reservation. And as I left there, I'm coming to Arizona, and they said, uh, did you come from Roswell? And I said, no. And he said, well, good, you don't look like a cone head because I have crop circles all <laughs> over the RV, you know. So I, I never did get to meet the lady, unfortunately. So That's true. And you, I know that you two would have developed a close relationship because yeah. you would have had a lot in common. But she really built you up for this grand finale, I think. Yes, that she was, did. That was wonderful, yeah. And she gave me all of her papers. She was serious enough about her story that she even had her attorney draw up a letter telling me that I was to be the person to tell her story and that she did want these things known. I think she was worried somehow that maybe her family would object or whatever. But we are going forward with this and her story will be told as part of the larger disclosure of these majestic 12 documents. Okay. Um, I understand you bought slides. Would we want to go into the slides now? Or? We would, but I would we like to, uh, to. I would okay. like to go into a bit more background. Okay, go right ahead. I'm just going to give you the floor here. Because we don't. One of the things that I thought about was, well, these tapes may be used by all kinds of different people. 
and some of them may not have a lengthy background in yeah. the investigation of UFOs or an understanding of what's going on. So I want to rapidly cover some basic material so that whoever watches this, whether they are a person who is an adept at this subject or a mm -hmm. newcomer, they can get to the level that we're at and understand what's going on right now in the field of ufology because this is probably the most exciting time to be involved in it. It is, yeah. Good times to live in. Exactly. Peter Davenport, the National UFO Reporting Center in Seattle, announced last week that in the space of 20 days, mm -hmm. that would be the very end of November and the very beginning of December of this year, 1998, there were 1,200 reported UFO sightings to the center in 20 days, which is far more than he and his short staff and their limited budget can handle. I filmed something over my daughter's house on one day after Thanksgiving, and I did not report that, so we can add that. We can make but that 1,201. Because I did show Is that that videotape? Yes, uh-huh. Well, that was an extraordinary yeah. event, yeah. and certainly one that I wished I could have been there for. Yeah. I guess the real question is, what is a UFO? In other words, we have to start somewhere and decide what is it that we're talking about, an unidentified flying object. And too often, that's become like a loaded phrase. And you mention UFO, and people in the news media, they turn off, and people in the military shrug their shoulders and turn away. Some people think that UFOs are like nuts and bolts spacecraft, and other people look upon it as a religious experience or the encounters with UFOs as being a doorway into the deepest realms of the universe. Some people consider it to be a fable. There are still other groups that will tell you that UFOs are nothing more than odd weather or hallucinations. I think in order to understand at all what's happening around us, and this is something I started learning from you, and it turns out that we've gone so far that now science and mysticism have met themselves somewhere in the middle. We don't live in a four-dimensional reality. Yeah, that's really important because in my circles, people always want to take that apart. And it really isn't. It is all part of the same thing, you know. Exactly. And, and as time goes on, ho hopefully with this new awakening, we will realize that. Yeah. I do not pretend to be a mathematician or a physicist, but in the process of studying UFOs, I've read an awful lot of books and plowed my way through some quantum physics books, even though I didn't understand all the math, trying to understand some of the ideas. And fortunately, there are some people who've done it for us. One of them was a man named Michael Talbot, mm -hmm. and one of the books that he wrote is extraordinary, called The Holographic Mind. And he talks about how, in order for the fundamental equations of quantum physics to be true in order for all the quarks and neutrinos and mesons and all these little hypothetical particles that no one can see exactly but they're sure that they have to be there because they're some part of the fundamental fabric of the universe in order for all of these things to do what they do we live in a ten-dimensional universe and at that level things do not operate the way they normally do. One thing can be in two places at once. Information can be communicated instantaneously from one part of the universe to the other. In many instances, the information is not so much communicated as it's already there. That's the concept of the hologram, that the whole is always in the smallest part and vice versa. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts and also each individual part contains the pattern of something much larger. And it's for that reason, aside from putting some scale on everything, that I think some of the slides that I'm going to show later are very, very important. Because you can see at a macroscopic level, looking out into the universe, some of the same things that you see under a microscope in the smallest drop of water. And when we start looking at the universe as circles and has greater and greater levels of reality, and as different dimensions, we're not stuck in this little linear box that says that we're all alone and that the Earth is a tiny little speck of dust way out on the edge of the Milky Way 
by a star that turns out to be pretty run-of-the-mill and like 90% of all the other stars that are in the sky. And instead we find that the universe is filled with energy and light and particles and dimensions. And I believe, I've come to the conclusion, beings of various types that exist at different levels. I can't necessarily prove their existence to you. Some of this is not a question of proof as much as it is coming to an understanding. Yeah, it's, it's a knowing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's a personal transformation. One of the things that I've learned along the way that has been valuable to me, one of the reasons that I pursue this mystery is, I guess it's like the alchemists who were looking for the philosopher's stone that would take lead and turn it into gold. Well, the real truth of the matter is that's not what the alchemist was looking for. The act of finding the philosopher's stone changed the alchemist and gave him the most intimate possible understanding of the universe. And that made him into a shaman or a sorcerer or whatever you want to call him, an enlightened being. And that's kind of far afield from where I want to go, but that's just to explain some personal perspectives. And that also explains why I've put such a high value on knowing you and trying to understand as much as I can about how you view the universe. You got a general idea? Good for you, because half of the time I don't know how you universe. I just make it up as I go along. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I want to make sure that everybody understands, I guess if I was going to say, what's the one thing, whoever views this tape, if they're going to listen to me and say, that man knows something about UFOs, what do I want them to take with them? I want you to remember the fact that there is one high-quality UFO event somewhere in the world every single hour of every single day. The only problem is very few of them get reported. It's not, and reality is not defined by CNN. I'm sorry to tell people that, but that's just the way it is. The fact that it's not on the nightly news doesn't mean that it didn't happen. 